Welcome to day two of criminal law. Uh, today we're going to be talking about punishment theories and why uh, we punish people uh, for committing transgressions against criminal law. So let's start with some big picture ideas and some sort of theoretical concepts, and then we'll move a little bit more into the application of those ideas and concepts that are a little bit more abstract. So to start, punishment uh, is long history in uh, Western societies, but really any uh, culture around the world has engaged in some form of punishment uh, for people that violate the codified or sanctioned norms of a society. Uh, nowadays, most Americans associate punishment uh, with prisons, jails, probation, uh, other forms of supervised release. Uh, but the history of punishment is actually much broader, as illustrated in the uh, slide. Uh, we see somebody being uh, paddled uh, as a form of corporal punishment while they're uh, stretched out over a barrel. In fact, uh, various forms of physical abuse and uh, corporal punishment were quite common in the early history of the United States. Uh, you could see things like branding, uh, where somebody would have put to their skin a mark indicating which crime uh, they committed or associating them with that crime. Uh, we even have instances of people's uh, hands or limbs being removed. Uh, there were a variety of, of uh, techniques that you know are a little more infamous, like the stocks, where somebody could be put in a central location of a city to be mocked and potentially uh, have things thrown at them uh, as a punishment for their crime. Uh, but there was also you know, a variety of uh, more localized techniques, uh, and these included ostracization or banishment, where people were expelled from a community for violating its laws. Um, but nowadays, we've really shifted towards this sort of prison and jail model, and, and there's reasons to wonder whether or not that's been a good uh, decision and uh, what we should consider in terms of appropriate punishment or even things that aren't wholly punitive uh, in constructing our criminal law um, to encourage better behavior or to uh, punish wrongdoing. So uh, there's a you know, the focus of what I'm going to talk about today is, is very much geared towards modern United States law and theory. Uh, but I will talk about some of the other um, ideas that have, in some cases, dropped by the wayside. Uh, in other cases, were specifically uh, excluded from modern understanding of punishment theory. Okay, so what do we mean by punishment theory? Well, we mean a theory that uh, explains when and how somebody should be punished. Um, it's independent from saying marijuana should be legal or uh, driving too fast in excess of the speed limit is a, a traffic violation or murder is wrong, right? Those are deciding the scope of criminal law. Punishment theory is saying, well, okay, now that we know that uh, a transgression or a violation has occurred, what is the appropriate punishment? And of course it can depend on the underlying crime. So there's a few, there's two major theories uh, that dominate uh, our modern understanding of uh, criminal law in the United States. Uh, the first is retribution. Right? Retribution is a moral theory that states a act of a criminal wrong uh, needs uh, to be punished by the state. Um, retribution is distinguished uh, from revenge uh, because it is uh, largely focused on the state's uh, action uh, to punish the wrongdoing or the wrongdoer. Uh, whereas at revenge, we associate more with an individual who feels that they've been wronged, taking personal uh, revenge uh, against uh, the wrongdoer. So retribution is one of our, our two major theories. Uh, the other is deterrence. Uh, deterrence is, um, you know, can be expressed by a very simple mathematical equation. Doesn't fully capture all the the odds and ends of it, but it's that the certainty of punishment times the severity of the punishment equals the amount of deterrence uh, that exists. And deterrence here meaning discouraging people uh, from committing this sort of crime in the future. It's very forward-looking, whereas retribution is very backward-looking. Now, we use the label deterrence, but as you note in some of the reading, uh, there's two types of deterrence, and really our law is focused on one of them. 
There is specific deterrence, which is specifically deterring and discouraging the individual defendant who is convicted uh, of ever committing this or si this wrong or something similar again. Uh, but that's a, a very minor consideration in modern punishment theory. What we usually care more about is what we call general deterrence, which is not focusing on this specific convicted person, but instead all other potential uh, people who might consider this crime. And so deterrence is, is focused on you know, general deterrence here, and which I'll use when I use the word deterrence, you should always assume I'm talking about general deterrence first is aimed at uh, making sure our society does not have a lot of criminals by having a high uh, frequently applied penalty for the most serious conduct and um, then a range of different punishments, uh, lesser punishments uh, for lesser crimes. Um, so to show you how the certainty and severity uh, intersection or, or formula works, uh, you might imagine a crime, which uh, is technically a traffic violation and is not a crime under ordinary circumstance, but we're going to, for the purposes of this hypothetical, just use the example of somebody speeding, right? Everyone speeds. Uh, everyone speeds at least one part of their trip, even, because generally speaking, a speed limit is treated as a suggested uh, range. Um, and so maybe it's only when you go down a hill if you're an extremely cautious driver. So uh, even though you will regularly see on highways or different roads people pulled over, the odds of any particular speeder being caught on in a uh, time that they're speeding is extremely low. In other words, the certainty of punishment is very low. What about the severity? Well, it varies from jurisdictions. It might depend a bit on your past record or, you know, um, you know, if you're a repeat offender. Uh, but generally, the severity for speeding is also very low. You pay a fine, which for people that with less money, it, you know, the severity is, is increased. But still, it's not long-term imprisonment. It's not the death penalty or something along those lines. And so we can see the deterrence of our rules about speeding uh, uh, is very low because the certainty and the severity are low. And so that's just an example to show how these two concepts interrelate. Uh, if we wanted to discourage uh, speeding and we said, well, let's just stop all speeding on the roads, well, let's apply the death penalty. Um, well, that, that would be insane, but it also would probably discourage speeding. Uh, even if the certainty was very low, suddenly the severity has increased to a level that uh, the sanction uh, for wrongdoing uh, would discourage uh, people. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the foundations of even these two theories. Uh, retribution is a deontological theory. As I said, it's a moral theory. Um, the idea here is that it's not concerned with the consequences of the punishment or uh, discouraging future actions like deterrence. Instead, it's just focused on there was a wrong, and there needs to be a corresponding proportional punishment. So I show the Ten Commandments here in the slide because it's, uh, you know, in, in the Western Christian tradition, it's a, an example of a deontological set of rules. Um, they do not say, thou shalt not kill because it has these X, Y, and Z consequences or it would lead to all sorts of things. It's just a moral commandment. And a retribution theory very much views uh, criminal law in the same way. Uh, it's, you know, retribution sometimes associated with the, the phrase, an eye for an eye. That might be a little reductive and, and take it into the world of revenge. But it, it, deontology means without regard to consequences, just based on the moral wrongdoing. And the greater the immorality of the wrongdoing, the greater the punishment uh, should be. In contrast, deterrence is a utilitarian theory. And so uh, utilitarianism, uh, if you didn't learn in your undergrad, uh, is uh, very much concerned about weighing costs and benefits and consequences. Um, Jeremy Bentham, one of the, the founding um, philosophers behind utilitarian theory depicted here, is, is he is a version, he had himself stuffed after he was uh, dead, and there he actually is looking outward at you right now. Uh, a little creepy, but utilitarianism is uh, very much concerned with what is the signal sent by criminal law? How is it interpreted? And so deterrence is a utilitarian theory because it is concerned with these ideas of potential criminals in the future. 
Um, and it does, you know, in our most serious crimes, we want to send the strongest signal possible. Now, some people sometimes ask, well, does utilitarian theory, shouldn't, you know, if we really want to deter everyone, we should just apply the death penalty across the board or, or whatever our most serious sanction is, life in prison or some other uh, a punishment that's considered so severe? Well, at face value, that seems, you know, a reasonable argument. But it misses a concept that's, that's built into both utilitarianism and deterrence, which is marginal deterrence, right? So let's imagine you're a jaywalker and jaywalking is considered a crime in your jurisdiction. If we're punishing jaywalking with death, you know, we're gonna leave certainty aside here, just focus on the severity. If, if you already are on the hook for the death penalty for jaywalking and a cop comes to apprehend you, well, you're not gonna give that police officer necessarily the same respect. In fact, you might, uh, if you have a weapon on you, you might consider shooting that officer from a deterrence perspective, because after all, you already um, committed conduct that takes you to the highest sanction. It doesn't seem wise uh, if we're just looking at the sort of rational uh, benefits and costs analysis. It doesn't seem rational uh, for you to just give up. Uh, instead, you should commit even greater crimes, right? You might rob a bank, you might uh, commit all sorts of offenses because you're already uh, at the highest sanction level for jaywalking. And so marginal deterrence says, no, no, that's exactly why um, we can't punish every crime with the most severe sanction. They have to be proportional because we don't want to encourage people uh, to increase their criminality or to escalate. Uh, so utilitarianism, you know, this is a complicated theory applied in the criminal law context very much uh, forms the general deterrence theory. Now, these are the two major theories that dominate our current system. Of course, in the reading, you see a lot of other theories. Uh, two other ones at least deserve mention. Uh, one is incapacitation. The idea here is if somebody is incapacitated, usually in the form of prison or jail, uh, they cannot commit a crime. It's different than specific deterrence because the argument behind incapacitation isn't what that person about what that person will do once they're released. It's no, actually, while they're detained, they can commit no crimes, at least in general society, they might be able to in prisons and jails. Uh, this, you know, is, is not used commonly to justify punishment. Uh, one example that is, you know, on the edge of our criminal justice system is the detaining of accused terrorists at Gitmo. Um, their incapacitation is used as a, a, a very strong rationale underlying uh, their detainment because it's not so much about deterring the future. Retribution is, is ambiguous because people have not even been tried and convicted uh, through military courts there. Instead, it's often justified as well, at least if they're held there, they can't commit any future crimes. But it is a very minor, minor part of our overall uh, criminal justice theory in the modern era. Uh, but one that did serve a bigger role and is diminished over time is rehabilitation. Uh, there is some indications that it's getting more currency in sort of uh, legislatures and, uh, and policymakers across uh, the country. But rehabilitation, uh, has very strong roots in the United States, particularly uh, from uh, religious uh, uh, ideas of people being redeemed and encouraging uh, them to uh, become righteous after they've committed wrongdoing. Uh, and so in the modern era, rehabilitation did reach a peak probably in the 1960s and 70s in the United States. And the focus there was, okay, now that a person has committed a crime, what can we do to help get them back uh, in being a law-abiding, um, contributing member of society. Uh, but rehabilitation it fell by the wayside a bit, and it was also, there was a lot of backlash against it. And many people felt it was a waste of resources, that it was pampering uh, people in prison. Uh, but it, you know, the goal was to decrease recidivism, to decrease repeat crimes. Um, certain programs that were rehabilitation-oriented worked better than others. Uh, but nowadays, it's, it's largely an afterthought. Now, you might hear that some prisons have vocational training. Um, these can fit in that sort of idea of rehabilitation, but in truth, uh, the way the programs are set up is rarely uh, as helpful as they appear on paper. Um, prison labor, uh, which is allowed under the United States Constitution, uh, if you don't know, and in fact, many people don't know until they actually look at it, the 13th Amendment of the Constitution bans slavery, 
except for in prisons. Uh, so slavery is legal in that, and that's how we have forced prison labor. And this is, you know, controversial, but many people uh, in the American public don't really uh, acknowledge or think it through. Uh, and so people can be forced to work, but also they can be paid uh, in very small amounts because the 13th Amendment also exempts indentured servitude uh, within a prison. Um, an indentured servitude, paying people, say, pennies uh, for hour, you know, or something well below the minimum wage, like a dollar per hour to say, learn basic repair skills or electrical skills. Sounds good, right? It might mean that this person who goes through this training will then be able to succeed uh, outside the prison using those skills. Uh, but the truth is that um, the use of prison labor itself often makes the skills that are taught um, not really useful on the outside. So for example, if electric um, appliance repair companies farm out all their minor appliances, things like lamps, um, you know, just like basic electrical work, and they farm it out to the prisons in a state. Uh, and then the prisoners repair it, they learn that skill. When the prisoners go on the outside, there's no jobs in that area because the jobs, uh, you know, wouldn't, are, are displaced by the very prison labor that they used, uh, to be, they were trained with. Um, and the prison labor is far cheaper than the minimum wage. And so vocational training programs, um, you know, they, they often sound better than they are in reality. Uh, it's much easier and I think more honest to think of them just as a form of prison labor, uh, whatever your viewpoints on um, the legitimacy and morality of uh, that. Okay, so those are two minor theories. There's some other ideas, particularly in um, criminal law scholars have expressivist theories and other concepts. But, you know, for our purposes, we want to focus on the law as it's being applied and the theoretical underpinnings of it. And, um, you know, that's, uh, these are the basics, and we'll talk more in class about those. Now, throughout the semester, um, the way the casebook is constructed is after a case or after sometimes just an introduction of concepts, there'll be a, a series of discussion questions. Now, ordinarily in these lectures, I will not go through these discussion questions because uh, that's meant for uh, our live uh, meetings. And so I will ignore those or skip over those in uh, the slides as I go through them. However, today I, I at least wanna um, walk through the three discussion questions that follow the introduction of uh, some of these theoretical concepts. And they're right at the beginning of the chapter because I wanna, um, help demonstrate how you should think about these questions, how you should engage them, uh, so that you're better prepared uh, when you come to our live meeting classes. Okay, so there were three basic questions at the outset of our punishment theory. Uh, they're illustrated here in the slide. I just wanna walk through them. So uh, the first one is, uh, what should be the punishment for a person that distributes 100 grams of cocaine per week? Okay, now just in that little question, there's already a lot probably going in your head, right? You might be thinking, well, should cocaine even be legal? Um, but let's leave that aside for now. Right now, we, we're going to accept uh, it is has been criminalized, and then we need to decide the appropriate punishment. Um, you know, of course, there's the problem of grams. Uh, one of the interesting things of America's uh, rejection of the metric system almost across the board is when it comes to drug crimes, uh, we, we've imported it. And so students are often um, confused. How much is 100 grams? Um, is that a lot? Is that a little? Uh, well, it's not too much. Um, and so we're not usually, um, we're not dealing with a big time dealer here. Uh, it's a very small amount. It might be distribution among a small group of friends. It might be that the person is taking some for personal use. Uh, we're dealing with a very limited quantity here. Okay, but how do we decide the appropriate punishment? Um, you know, under retribution theory, this sort of, you know, eye for an eye uh, maxim, which I, you know, talked about some problems with already, you know, it works well when we think about, well, if somebody committed, you know, murder, um, therefore we might think the death penalty is justified. In other words, those seem proportional. I'm not saying you should support the death penalty or not, it's just retribution, you know, sort of, there's, a, there's an obvious connect and parallel between the wrongdoing and the punishment. 
But as we get to crimes that you know aren't interpersonal in nature, um, they're not theft, uh, they're not things that um, have an obvious corresponding way of punishing, uh, then it gets more difficult, especially if we're going to use prison and jails, which is sort of a one-size-fits-all punishment for most of our crimes. What is the magic number? Um, the United States is an outlier in the world uh, among similarly situated nations in terms of the level of incarceration we have, right? The book illustrates relatively recent data um, that shows our, our rate of incarceration is vastly higher uh, than other nations. And part of that's because we do have a tendency to just think, well, 100 grams a week, oh, maybe 10 years, maybe 20. Well, this is difficult. Even from a deterrence perspective, it, the answer isn't obvious, right? Because how do we evaluate the social costs and consequences of distribution of cocaine, particularly if we're just focused on this individual? And what is the signal that we need to send? These are, these are complex questions, but they're things that I want you to think through with these discussion questions. And then I add even more wrinkles to it, right? Does it matter if the person has a prior history? In general, uh, I think most people's intuition is yes. If they're repeat offenders, they should be punished more harshly. Um, that's, I think, a, a view that's emerged strongly in the United States. And it's culminated in what we generally know as three strikes laws, right? If you commit three serious crimes as defined in the state laws, and we'll look at a case soon about uh, an example of this, um, they often get lifetime imprisonment. But when you look at the underlying conduct that trigger those three strikes, it's often um, worrisome how easy it is to hand out these harsh penalties when people might have committed three relatively minor uh, thefts, um, but they qualify and count as serious enough uh, to trigger um, a lifetime of imprisonment. And so even if we think prior criminal history matters, how much should it matter in we assessing the punishment? Is it different under retribution theory? Is it different under deterrence theory? I think it's fair to say uh, the concept of prior history makes much more sense in a deterrence theory because we worry that the person has not gotten the message from prior punishments. Retribution theory would generally say, well, we want to look at this particular crime. Um, although perhaps, you know, especially historically, retribution was broader. We look at the overall moral worthiness of a person and their prior crimes might matter. But generally, the modern view of retribution is focused on the particular crime for which the person has just been convicted. Uh, how do we compare the, the cocaine distributor uh, with somebody who commits automobile theft, assault and battery with a deadly weapon, embezzlement, right? Each of these crimes operates in a, a different way and it's affecting society. And for retribution theory, it's hard to pin down the moral uh, blameworthiness or wrong that we associate with each of those crimes. Um, then let's go to our second question, uh, which is uh, if a woman is arrested for shoplifting, uh, should a sentencing judge uh, consider alternatives uh, if she is pregnant, right? This is a, a real problem um, that, that is often overlooked, that we have uh, pregnancies in prison. We have people with small children and, and, you know, who are then taken away and put in prison. And so the issue of moms in prison is not an obvious one. Retribution theory would generally disregard these concerns um, because we have to punish the person there. Maybe there would be some sort of exception for uh, an unborn fetus or a small child. It's not clear. Deterrence theory is also, it's not a clear fit, right? How do we make this fact work? So maybe, maybe we should ignore it, but it's, it's a reality that often has uh, effects on third parties. In this case, small children, Families uh, can be severely affected by incarceration. Communities across the United States, particularly in uh, majority minority communities, uh, there is a high enough rate of incarceration that it fundamentally distorts the demographics. You are often missing large chunks of particularly the men from ages 18 to 29. And that, you know, is, is not something that we can continue to ignore. And yet retribution deterrence theory don't give us obvious answers here. Um, does your uh, opinion change if instead of shoplifting, she's guilty of battery, grand theft, homicide? In other words, does the pregnancy really count with minor crimes? These are, these are questions that there's not easy or right answers to. Uh, but the, the idea is to get you thinking. And therefore, when we, I say discussion questions, these are things to be discussed. Okay. Our last discussion question before getting into our case, uh, here is, um, who should be more harshly punished in the following uh, homicide cases? A highly intoxicated person who shoots and kills her friend during a heated argument, 
an assassin who kills uh, another person for profit, a 15-year-old who kills a bully at school, or a husband who kills his spouse when he finds out uh, that his spouse has committed adultery. Now, I'm not going to walk through this one as much, but what I want to highlight here is, is, in fact, our criminal law does distinguish between each of these, and the ones that it considers the most severe might be a little surprising to you. So uh, these are things that I want you to spend time. You might write down your answers. Um, you know, you don't have to turn them in, but I think it's important to be ready to answer all of these right away because I will ask them uh, of many of you uh, during the classes. Okay, so that's our little walkthrough on how to handle discussion questions throughout the semester. Um, let's talk about our case. Now, last time I said that one of the key things to know about criminal law is um, cases are illustrations, right? You know, they don't embody universal rules, except for a few exceptions. Well, this case doesn't fit either uh, category cleanly. It's not just an illustration, although it is in part, and um, it's not a, a global universal uh, rule like a constitutional rule. Instead, this case is included in the text as part for the illustration, but more because Judge Weinstein decided to outline um, pretty much uh, all of Western theory of uh, punishment. Um, and that's, you know, kind of unusual. No, it's extremely unusual in a given court opinion. Um, and Judge Weinstein were actually going to have two opinions like this during the semester. He also has one about mens rea, which we'll get to later. Um, this opinion I have edited down um, substantially, right? This, this opinion goes on for scores of pages. I mean, it is incredibly lengthy and detailed, but I wanted to get the highlights. So, Part of reading this case is not just the facts and the illustration, it's to, it's basically part of the text itself. I've uh, taken part of Judge Weinstein's analysis here and, and incorporated it. So uh, you should treat this like any part of the text uh, that is not in the cases, right? It's about the facts and the, or, or the history uh, and details here. Okay, so what actually happens in my um, Because I've already talked a lot about the punishment theory, we'll talk more uh, in class. Um, we have two defendants. Right. They are interior decorators um, and they are charged with various offenses related to racketeering and money laundering. Uh, and their work um, becomes very much focused on one client uh, who's depicted here, uh, Jose Santa Cruz uh, Londano. Now, what is interesting about uh, him is he's a, an incredibly powerful drug dealer uh, during the time uh, that they are working for him in the 1980s. Okay, so what, how are interior, I mean, there's no crime in decorating a, uh, the home or the office or whatever properties of a uh, drug dealer. Uh, so what is it that these defendants have done? Well, it's one of the reasons I, I picked this case, right? Because money laundering, although it's been in the news in the last few years a bit more, um, is a crime that's hard to wrap your head around at first. In fact, many students might just look at the facts of this case and think, well, what did the defendants only do wrong? I mean, they worked for somebody who was a criminal, but they got him good stuff. They weren't committing fraud. They weren't overcharging. Well, this is this is an important um, uh, you know way or important set of facts to understand. You know how something like money laundering can be uh, a substantial and significant crime in terms of what we punish. Because if you look at the two defendants here, they were sentenced to uh, 135 to 168 months with a possible fine of almost 14 and a half million. Uh, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's independent of it, but that's meant to you know get back a lot of the money they were making in this. But it's an enormous amount of prison time, right? We are dealing with sentences. Uh, automatically over 10 years. Um, so why, what, how, what have they done that's really wrong? Well, this gets to two um, reasons you might want to launder money uh, and what money laundering is. Uh, and maybe the, the best way to start understanding is to realize that, in fact, many people in organized crime over the years have been uh, prosecuted not for the murders, not for the um, uh, violent crimes that they committed, uh, alone, uh, and in some famously Al Capone, uh, was only prosecuted for crimes related to his failure to pay taxes, right? Because one of the problems a, a major criminal has is they have all this money, uh, and how do they explain where they got it, right? This is a tax problem. They, uh, on the one hand, uh, could just try to hide it like Al Capone did and just, you know, not tell the, the tax authorities that they have uh, made all this income, and then they expose themselves to tax fraud. 
Uh, but another way to deal with it, and the way that uh, modern criminals do uh, and at, at this level in organized crime, is to launder the money, which is to take the bad money that is accumulated through illicit means and make it clean, means associate it with a legitimate business opportunity. So if you've seen the show The Sopranos, um, you know, Tony Soprano was, uh, he used uh, the garbage collection industry uh, is his primary means of money laundering. In other words, it's a business which may be, you know, profitable or make money on its own, uh, but uh, it's serving as a mechanism to take the dirty money invested in that business and then clean money comes out because now you can report, say, what your garbage collection business did. Well, one of the things that a uh, defendant does in this case is he changes his uh, money into objects, right? Statues, paintings, things with value. So this is, this is one reason, taxes. Uh, but there's also, uh, in the case of international organized criminals, signs of customs uh, interest as well, which is getting money in and out of country is, is not uh, easy. Uh, you know, you have to report it. And if you don't, that can carry penalties as well. But moving objects in and out of countries as opposed to bags of cash uh, or uh, putting things in, in various banks and so forth, those, those are different strategies. But, you know, this is one of the ways uh, that money laundering has occurred. And it has a side effect to, uh, you know, in fact, in many cases, uh, the drug dealers that have bought all this stuff, it's because they have so much money and they want nice stuff around them. I mean, their sole focus is not just avoiding tax or customs penalties. Um, Pablo Escobar, you know, famously built a whole zoo on his property. Um, now, of course, that was in Colombia and he wasn't avoiding uh, U.S. tax law there. But it is a reality that, that buying these really nice things uh, can serve a dual function. But one of the functions that we're focused on is the money laundering. Well, why would you why would you use these statues or paintings? Well, those are goods that are often in a very thin market, meaning that there's not a lot of people paying for them. There's not a clearly defined market value. So, if our drug dealer wants to overpay for it or just sink a lot of cash into it and then resell it at a different value, no one's going to know whether or not that painting or statue um, really went up and down in value. The re the reported sale. Um, isn't going to raise a lot of eyebrows because these are difficult things to value. It's very subjective. And so they're not fungible, meaning not as interchangeable as cash, but they can serve a similar function. And so um, in this case, the interior decorators at some point crossed the line. They didn't just know that they were working for a drug dealer. They were facilitating these transactions in order to clean uh, on known as money. So this is what well, Okay, now I said why it's a crime, but why is it a serious crime? Why does this deserve this punishment? Well, this does relate to the overall uh, view of, of illegal drugs and drug sales and distribution. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, can be associated with other crimes as well. But the facts here were focused with it. So if you believe that drug, drug distribution um, is a serious problem uh, in Colombia during this time, uh, a lot of violence was associated there and in the U.S. from this. Cocaine was the primary drug distributed. And so um, these two interior decorators were a arguably necessary part of that. They weren't dealing, you know, on the corner. Uh, they weren't ordering other people to attack neighbor gangs or get territory, but they were what made it profitable, right? They were what allowed the money to be accumulated, for it to be used. And so they're part of it. They're, they're basically a form of a bank here. Um, and so this is a, a tricky crime. And that's why I think it's, it's really notable that Judge Weinstein decides to talk about this punishment theory because at the end of the day, you'll notice he doesn't necessarily connect it very strongly to the punishments that he thinks are justified here. Um, because it's difficult to do that, right? It's difficult to say, well, retribution says this is a, this is a five-year crime. I mean, it's, there's not a, a formula, right? Even with our math, mathematical aspect of deterrence, Right? The severity and certainty only tells us how much the deterrent effect would be. It doesn't actually say how much crime will stop. It doesn't actually say what the social costs of the crime were in the first place. And so this is a tough uh, um, you know, problem in our, our criminal law, which is we have these theories that have been written about for centuries. 
And going back to, you know, ancient Greece, uh, you see uh, Judge Weinstein, you know, looking at the early bases here and um, even before that in, in Babylon. But, you know, at the end of the day, the judge has still got to make a specific um, uh, punishment. And that will usually be her crimes at this level, prison, jail. And so one of the things I want you to start thinking about is we'll talk about in class is how do we use these budget theories? Are they really usable? Um, and with that, I'll finish for today and uh, we'll talk further about Blair and the underlying theories.